Good evening. Thank you for your patience. We're starting a little bit late tonight because as you saw, we had an extraordinary turnout for tonight's event. So our apologies for that. But I'm thrilled to welcome you, just thrilled to the first Longwood Seminar of 2016. I'm Gina Vild, I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations at Harvard Medical School and the Chief Communications Officer. It was 15 years ago that Harvard Medical School first launched the Longwood Seminars, our mini med school, because we wanted to bring the very rich and broad science from Harvard Medical School and all of its discoveries to the Boston community. But now we are expanding our audience and we live stream and we last year had viewers from 36 countries and I'm sure we're welcoming that many people again tonight. And also tonight, we're expanding our audience even more with our very first ever Periscope broadcast via Twitter. So for all of you who are in this room and those of you who are watching from afar, welcome. And I hope you enjoy tonight's program. You may know that our mini med school topics are chosen through crowdsourcing. Um, if you've participated in the, fa in the past, you've been, you will have been asked to vote. And we also um, crowdsource through social media. So this year's topics were chosen by you. And tonight they are, of course, this evening's Now and Zen. And on March 22nd, A Better Ending, A New Beginning for End of Life. On April 5th, Taking It All In, Environmental Toxins and Your Health. And April 19th, The New Old Age, How the Body Ages and How to Keep It Young. Now, just a few brief announcements, details of which will be on the screen, are on the screen right now. Everyone is eligible for certificates of completion, and teachers may receive professional development points. You'll see the URL for our website, and if you visit it, you'll have access to all of our past and this year's Longwood seminars, as well as additional supplemental reading material. Finally, we always have a most robust Twitter conversation, and we hope that you'll participate. So please join us on Twitter using the hashtag HMSMiniMed, which you'll see on the screen. Now for tonight's program, Now and Zen, How Mindfulness Can Change Your Brain and Improve Your Health. The idea that Eastern meditation could be studied by Western science was revolutionary. Born right here in Massachusetts. Did you know that in 1979, John Kabat-Zinn founded the first mindfulness-based stress reduction program? And around that time, Harvard Medical School professor Herbert Benson also began his pioneering research into mind-body medicine. Today, these Eastern complement, complement, <coughs> excuse me, tonight these Eastern traditions and practices are integral to our own culture with mindfulness taught to soldiers and CEOs, athletes and students. It's taught from kindergarten classrooms to the halls of Harvard Business School. Harvard neurobiologists, clinical researchers, and mental health practitioners have been pioneers in this newly emerging science. They're teaching us about how the ancient practice of mindfulness affects medical treatments as well as mental and physical well-being. Today, I am truly thrilled to welcome three of Harvard's experts on the topic. They'll share with you findings of the health benefits of meditation. I promise that what they tell you will change the way you think about the brain. First, Sarah Lazar, who we're always thrilled to have speak at our events, is an HMS assistant professor of psychology at the school and associate researcher in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. David Vago is an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and an associate psychologist in the Functional Neuroimaging Laboratory at Brigham and Women's Hospital. But first you'll hear from John Denninger. Dr. Denninger is an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and serves as the director of research at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Mass General. His work overseeing the basic and clinical research program there explores the relationship between stress reduction, resiliency enhancement, and health. He is also the associate director of the Mass General McLean Hospital Adult Psychiatry Residency Training Program. 
So before he takes the podium, I'd like to leave you with these two thoughts from the poet and author Thich Nhat Hanh. Mindfulness is the miracle which can call back in a flash our dispersed mind and restore it to wholeness so that we can live each minute of life. And also a quote that I love, only this actual moment is life. Please welcome Dr. Denninger, and thank you for joining us. Can you all hear me? Excellent. I can see my slides. You can see my slides. It is amazing to see a crowd like this here. I am just thrilled. Um, and you all should feel very lucky to be in this room, it sounds like, because so many people were trying to get in. Um, so welcome to all of you. I'm going to be talking today about uh, many, many things. I'm going to start off just by quickly showing my disclosures for those who are interested. And then I'm going to read you a poem. This is a poem by William Wordsworth. The world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lea, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his reeved horn. That's a fountain that depicts Triton there, one of the gods of the sea from the old days. So why do I read you this poem? Are people familiar with this poem? The world is much with us, yes. So Wordsworth was writing back in 1802, more than 200 years ago, about the modern world and noting that people were so caught up in things uh, that they were losing sight of what was important. And the kinds of approaches that we're going to be talking about today, mind-body approaches like mindfulness, which have these ancient roots in just about every culture throughout the world, these are the kinds of uh, techniques that provide tools for all of us, children to adults, to people of advancing age, all of us, to deal with the stresses that seem to be just growing every day in the modern world. And the fantastic thing and the thing that we're going to learn about today is that these approaches now, on a day, almost a day-by-day -day basis, have a growing amount of support from cutting-edge science. How many of you have ever experienced any stress? Every day, all the time. All right, so stress, it's not always bad. There are good kinds of stress. It, living a life without stress would not be very wonderful either, but stress can have bad effects on your both brain and body. Some, some large proportion of visits that people make to doctors are based on illnesses that are either caused or worsened by stress. And stress, this is, this is a thing that we're all going to be having to think about over the next 100 years. Stress contributes to non-communicable diseases. These are the things that are going to be the, the, the things that healthcare has to deal with over the next 100 years. Things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory diseases, psychiatric disorders like depression and anxiety. These are the kinds of things that our country and the world is going to struggle with over the next 100 years. These are the kinds of things that are starting to be shown to be addressable by techniques like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, etc. Things like high blood pressure, things like depression. These are the kinds of things that where these techniques can have benefits um, for human health and disease. Just going to tell you briefly about the Benson Henry Institute uh, for Mind Body Medicine, where I'm the director of research. So we're an independent thematic center at Mass General Hospital here in Boston. We do clinical practice, research, and education. We essentially study ways 
in which uh, we can reduce stress and increase resiliency for people of all kinds. Using techniques, using practices like meditation, yoga, and tai chi. I'll talk about those in a second. The important thing to take away, if you take nothing else away from what I'm saying today, is that these kinds of practices, these kinds of approaches can reduce the bad effects that stress can have on your body and make you more resilient. One of the main focuses today is mindfulness. So um, I don't know if Sarah remembers this, but a few years ago, she and I shared a podium with John Kabat-Zinn. And I actually can't remember if I spoke before him or after him, but I remember him getting up and talking about how the things that we were teaching, these are not techniques. This is a way of life. And I felt like a total jerk. Because as you heard me just say, I say techniques all the time. And I think in my talk, I had referred to them as techniques over and over and over again. But the important thing is to remember that what we're talking about today, these are things that are not just something that you do in a moment or 20 minutes of practice. These are things that can be integrated into your life in a very broad way. So I'm going to, who, has anyone heard of mindfulness? Before you saw the title of the symposium, yeah? Good. So mindfulness, I, this is my favorite definition. This is John Kabat-Zinn's definition. So mindfulness is awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose, so in a very thoughtful way, in the present moment, and possibly most importantly, non-judgmentally. There are many ways to cultivate mindfulness. One is meditation. Does everyone know what meditation is? Have people heard of meditation? Has anyone in the room practiced meditation of any kind? A few, a few. Has anyone heard of yoga? Yes, anyone in here ever done yoga? I'm, I st I'm pretty good at meditation, I stink at yoga. Uh, how about Tai Chi? Anyone heard of Tai Chi or done Tai Chi? That's fantastic. So meditation and yoga are uh, thousands of years old. There's, there's debate about how old these things are, but they seem to ar have arisen very early in human society. Tai Chi, there's a little bit of debate. Some say it's uh, uh, you know, from the 1200s. Others say, no, it's really from the 1700s. Also a fairly old technique based in martial arts. Uh, has anyone ever heard of laughter yoga? So I assume that laughter yoga was thousands of years old, but it was actually invented in the 90s, the 1990s, <laughs> um, something I learned only recently. So these are all ways that we can uh, cultivate mindfulness and elicit something uh, that uh, Dr. Herbert Benson, who is one of the founders of this field and was here at, is here at Harvard Medical School and is the founder of our institute, calls the relaxation response. So the relaxation response is best thought of as the state which is elicited by techniques like meditation, like yoga, like Tai Chi. Has anyone ever experienced the stress response where all of a sudden you see something or hear something or read something and your heart starts pounding? You know, back in the old, old days, primitive days, maybe you were being chased by a saber-toothed tiger or something like that. Nowadays, it's like, oh my God, I have to prepare my taxes. <laughs> my boss sent me a really snide email. What does that mean? All right, that is the stress response. The relaxation response can be conceptually thought of as the opposite to that. So if the stress response is your body going on alert because of some perceived stress, some perceived threat, the relaxation response is calming down from that, backing off from that. It's, it's a state that is accompanied by physiological changes like your heart rate slowing down, your breathing slowing down. Has anyone who's done practices like yoga and meditation ever experienced anything like that? So, Many of the positive physiological benefits of techniques, oops, said it again, practices like meditation, 
yoga, tai chi, may come from this state, from eliciting this state. Just to give a quick plug, we have a program that we teach at the Benson Henry Institute called the Stress Management Residency Training Program. This is how we teach people how to use these practices. All right, so I originally had a, a slide that was all like money up here because I wanted to talk about healthcare. Is anyone aware of the fact that healthcare in this country is relatively expensive? <laughs> people have heard that. It's not just me. All right, so this is, this is to remind me to talk about that problem. So it is a problem. We have a huge burden of health care costs in our country. And one of the things that we are trying to do is we're trying to figure out a way that we can help people to help themselves, that we can employ greater amounts of self-care, just in the same way that people exercise and eat right and the like, we may be able to find ways for people to use practices like meditation, yoga, etc., to improve their brain and body health. So one of the things that we wanted to uh, figure out, and uh, James Stahl was the primary mover for this, for this work, is is there a way to figure out if this, these kinds of techniques, this kind of stuff, is actually able to save money by helping people to help themselves, by allowing people to use more self-care? So this looks busy. It really is super simple. And it's really just about counting. So what we did was we took all of the people who came to our institute and went through our programs. And we counted. So if this is the uh, given person who went through the program, this is the time they went through the program, and then we counted each time they saw a doctor, they went to the emergency room, they had a lab tested, and we counted both in the year before and the year after they went through our program. Does that make sense to everybody? It's counting. We then total those all up, and there'll be a number of these, and I'll just explain it here. This is what's called a histogram. So this is the number of patients here, and this is the number of billable encounters, the number of times people went to the doctor, saw a uh, doc in the emergency room, had a lab test, et cetera. And so what you see here is that there are a lot of people who have a relatively low number of billable encounters, and then there are a few people out at the end, presumably people who are very ill, who had a, have a lot of encounters, so people who see the doctor a lot. We did the same thing with, this was all the folks over uh, a roughly seven year period who had gone through our program, something on the order of um, uh, 4,000, 4, 4,500 people. We then did the same thing with a group of 13,000 people from our database who went through, who didn't go through our program, but who we had records on, who we had data about. So we could do the same kind of counting, but in this case, the central point was just the middle of the time that they were in our records. Does that make sense? So we counted the year before and the year after, totaled that all up. What did we find? What we found was in the people who had been through our program, there was a change from, remember this, as you go down here, these are more billable encounters here. There was a change from a lot of billable encounters to not so many in the year after. Pretty impressive. Are you impressed? I was impressed. When James showed me this, I was like, wow, that's incredible. In the, in the control group, and again, these were matched for level of illness, et cetera, there were essentially no changes. They didn't start out going to the doctor very much, but there was no change in the year after. All right, so that's, has anyone ever heard of something called regression to the mean? You know what that means? So, so that basically means when, if you've got some extreme, like if it's really hot in, in the winter for a while, it, on average, things tend to regress to the mean. They tend to go back to average, okay? 
So if you look at a certain population, oops. If you look at a certain, I keep doing, pressing the wrong button. If you look at a certain population, this might just be that, oh, they're going back to average. So what we did was we then took the people who were at the highest end of how much they were going to the doctor, going to the emergency room, et cetera, from both of these groups, both of the groups who had been through our program and the groups who had just uh, been in our system. And so we set their level of billable encounters the same. And what we saw is that, yes, there was a decrease for the people who were in the control group, but there was a more significant decrease for the people who had been through our program. What does that mean? That means that learning techniques like meditation, becoming proficient at eliciting that state I was talking about before, that that seems to have not just an effect on you personally, how you feel, but it actually has an effect on how much you need to use the medical system. And what does that mean for all of us? It means potential savings. So we, this is the early part of a story. Most of what I'm going to be talking about today is an early part of a story, not a finished answer. But this suggests that there is the possibility to save thousands, potentially tens of thousands of dollars, of dollars a year for every person who learns to use these kinds of techniques. That's pretty impressive, don't you think? All right. Anyone know what that is, the thing that's spinning around? DNA, DNA, that's correct, that is DNA. So that's a DNA molecule spinning around, slowly pirouetting. So one of the things that we have tried to understand from the very beginning is how practices like meditation can affect biology. And what we've been able to show, us and other groups as well, is that these kinds of practices actually can affect how genes are turned on and off. I hasten to say we're not changing the genes. What we're doing is we're changing how they are regulated. So how genes turn on and turn off, for those who know the terminology, how levels of messenger RNA are regulated. I sometimes use the, use the metaphor, the genes, which are the DNA, they're like the blueprint. The messenger RNA is like a photocopy of that blueprint that you give to the guy that's you know, putting in the bathroom, right? He doesn't need the whole thing. He just needs to know what he's going to put in the bathroom, right? So each cell is different. Each cell, your brain cells are different from your blood cells, are different from your liver cells. They need a different copy, a different part of the blueprint. And so that's what messenger RNA is like. That's what we're affecting is what genes are turned on and off in a given cell at a given time or a given group of cells. And not to give you the punchline right at the beginning, but we've been able to show changes in genes that are associated with things like energy metabolism. Does anyone know what the mitochondria are? Mitochondria are like the powerhouses of each cell. So we, genes that affect how mitochondria uh, work. Insulin secretion, which is important for diabetes. Telomere maintenance, have people heard of telomeres? So telomeres are known to be important in aging and in cellular senescence. And so these are the kinds of things that may actually have a long-term effect on how long people live. We've also been able to show reduced expression of genes that are associated with inflammation. So inflammation, obviously, necessary for the body, but too, men too much inflammation, not as anyone who's ever had anything that was inflamed, as you know, not good for you. And then stress-related pathways as well. Many, many potential mechanisms for health effects. And I'm just going to very, very quickly tell you about how we did this experiment. I'm not going to go over all the details. But essentially what we did is we compared people who had been uh, meditating for a long time, long-term practitioners, on average people who had been using various practices, not just meditation, yoga as well, repetitive prayer, I'll show that in a second, for on average nine years. And we compared them to people who had never done any of this stuff. We drew blood from them, we measured their me messenger RNA, we looked at up to 50,000 genes at a time and figured out what was different. We then took 
the people who had never practiced before, and we taught them how to meditate. We did that for eight weeks, and then we measured them at the end. So we were, what we're looking at is how these groups differ and how their genes are turned on and off. And like I said, we used a broad variety of practices. All kinds of different meditation, different kinds of yoga, and repetitive prayer as well. And we saw this common set of changes. So the first really exciting result is that we saw distinct differences between the people who had had many years of practices and people who had never practiced at all. So there was something different. Now, this is not a perfect experiment, I hasten to add. There are all kinds of reasons why we might not uh, say this is the final answer, but want to do additional studies, which we do. But that's still a pretty impressive result. So long-term meditation appears to be able to change how genes are turned on and off. More exciting than that, I think, is that we were able to see a subset of those same changes in the people who had never practiced before, comparing before they started practicing and after the eight weeks of practicing. So eight weeks of practice, 20 minutes a day, led to clear changes in how genes were turned on and off. Don't you want to go out and start doing this stuff right now? And those, are, those, those changes in the people who had been practicing for eight weeks, those were a subset of the ones that we saw in the long-term practitioners, as you might expect. All right. I'm going to leave you with one more. I'm going to tell you about one more study that we did. So we and a number of other groups in this genomic stuff that we have been doing have found that one molecule, I've actually shown it here. This is the molecule. This is NF-kappa-P. That's a protein. That's DNA looking down the long end, like looking down the axis of DNA. So this protein, NF-kappa-B, is what's called a transcription factor. This is a protein that binds to DNA and actually acts as a switch. It turns on and off the genes that it is designed to regulate. Does that make sense to everybody? It's like, you know, when it sits on DNA, the, the things that transcribe the DNA can't get through. And so it actually can turn uh, that transcription on and off. It can regulate the genes. So we and others have found a decrease in that gene, which is a central immune modulating switch. It's something that helps the immune system figure out whether to be on or off, to put it very, very crudely. And so we wanted to look in, we had done a lot of this work in people who were healthy. And so we wanted to look in people who had an illness where inflammation was important. And so we looked in people with inflammatory bowel disease. So inflammatory bowel diseases are things like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. You guys heard of those? So these are, these are diseases where basically there's too much inflammation in the gut. And what would it, we, I won't go through the gory details of the individual genes and stuff, but this is some of the data from that. What we were able to show is that there were changes in genes that you see upregulated in inflammatory bowel disease. Those got downregulated. And genes that you normally see downregulated those got upregulated. So we were basically able to push up or push down the genes that were appropriate for the disease that we were talking about. What does this mean? This means that there's a lot more to be figured out, but we know the difference, and we'll be able to figure out the difference where these kinds of techniques are most helpful. If you have a given disorder, you have a given um, predilection, you, we can tell you, we will be able to tell you in the future what kinds of techniques you should employ, how long you should do them for, and what they will be most helpful for. Thank you very much. And now, I'm going to do my, I'm going to lead a meditation. All right. Who would like to try this? Some people. Some people don't have to. You don't have to. I don't know if it's possible. It may not be, because we're filming and stuff, it may not be possible to dim the lights. But if we can dim the house lights, that would be lovely. 
What I'm going to do now is a very brief, I will check my watch, a very brief, what's called a breath focus meditation. You don't have to do it. If you're not comfortable doing it, you don't have to. But if you're comfortable doing so, you can sit with your feet flat on the floor. You may want to put anything that's in your lap on the floor, too. You can rest your hands in your lap. If you're comfortable doing so, you can close your eyes. If you're not comfortable closing your eyes, you can pick a point a little bit in front of you and just let your focus go soft. And what I'd like you to do is just notice your breath. Notice how the breath goes in and out. You might start noticing the movement of air into your nostrils and out of your nostrils. Maybe the sensation of coolness as it comes in, warmth as it goes out. Maybe you'll notice the gentle swelling and then deflation of your belly as you breathe. You may notice how the breath expands your chest and then allows it to deflate as you exhale. And if you're at all like me, as you do this, things will come into your mind. And anyone who thinks that meditation is about your mind being blank, you can dispel that thought right now. Meditation is about noticing when your mind comes up with something. Noticing a feeling in your body. Noticing a sound in the room. And what you can do when you notice something is in a non-judgmental way, see what it is. And then as you're comfortable, return your focus back to your breath. Back to your body breathing at the rate and in the way that it wants to breathe. And if, as you're breathing in and out, you notice a sensation, maybe it's an uncomfortable one. Maybe there's a, some tightness in your neck or your lower back. Allow your awareness to just inhabit that area for a moment just to see what's there. No pressure to do anything about it. Just to be aware of it. And then always, as is comfortable for you, return your focus to your breath. To the air flowing into your lungs, filling your being. And then leaving your body 
to fill the world around you. As we come to the end of this very brief meditation, what I'd like you to do is expand your awareness from your breath to take in your whole body first. And then I'd like it to expand to take in the room around you, the sounds that you hear, the smells, the sensations. And then knowing that you can take this feeling of peace and awareness with you for the rest of the day. As you're comfortable, I'd like you to slowly open your eyes and return to the room. All right, I don't have too much time to go to every person and ask how it was. But what our experience is is that it is likely that some people really enjoyed that. And there are almost certainly people in the room who did not. And that is not bad. Having, having things that are difficult come up or having it be difficult to do that, just like you know, training for a marathon or something like that, it's not always pleasant, I imagine. I've never done it. In the same way, doing this kind of practice is not always pleasant, but it is, it is often very fulfilling. Any, anyone want to shout out a response, a, a, an experience? Felt great. What was that? Anxious. Very relaxing. Very relaxing. Peaceful. peaceful. Mindful. Very peaceful. peaceful. Journey. Journey. All of that experience is worthwhile to notice. All right. I would love to do this for another hour, (laughs) but we should probably move on. We can bring up the house lights. Oh, please continue for another five minutes with the applause. All right, I now have the privilege to, if I remember who I'm introducing first, it's David, yeah. Um, So David, we already went over his titles before, but I'll just say again that David is an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School an associate psychologist in the Functional Neuroimaging Laboratory at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, He's done a postdoctoral fellowship um, in the Department of Psychiatry at Brigham and Women's, and also the Utah Center for Exploring Mind-Body Interactions, uh, and the Stuart Hauser uh, Research Training Program in Biological and Social Psychiatry at Judge Baker's Children's Center. So David's research interests focus on using translational models. So ways to bring discoveries in the lab to the bedside, ultimately, to understand how the brain works, to be better able to diagnose and treat mental illness. Ultimately, his work is focused on finding ways to clarify how techniques like the ones we have been talking about Um, and interactions among mind and brain and body can be used to help patients. Specifically, he has been focusing on the study of mindfulness-based interventions in clinical settings and understanding the basic mechanisms that these kinds of practices bring about. Please welcome David Vago. Thank you so much, John. Um, Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, This is a great group. Thank you. This guy, big hat, love the hat. Um, Twitter, the Twitter, Twitter sphere, 
I love it. I love the fact that we have a Twitter sphere. Um, wonderful. And all the people who are out um, listening globally to this great talk. So I, I want to uh, start with some broad strokes and paint some broad strokes so we can create a framework uh, by which you can understand how the, these mindfulness-based meditation practices work. Um, because the, the science of meditation and mindfulness is a relatively young science. And we're just slowly approaching a level of precision in our theoretical and mechanistic account by which these practices reduce suffering, uh, promote self-transformation, and enhance human flourishing. Okay, so let's start by looking at a single meditator. So uh, when we talk about uh, what's happening in the brain of a meditator, we want to start with one meditator. And uh, we want to understand uh, exactly by, by what's going on in their, in their mind and their brain while they're practicing meditation, right? And maybe in the context of dealing with stress. Uh, and we use contemporary or modern uh, neuroimaging techniques to do that. Uh, and through neuroimaging and a combination of that plus first person introspective reports, we can create what we, what we refer to as a neurophenomenological approach, okay? to better get a sense of the landscape or the, uh, the maps with certain networks in the brain and how these networks are affected by the, the meditation practice itself, right? And we do this also by focusing not only on one meditator, but by focusing on the entire spectrum of experience. So starting with just a novice, with what just happened today with the nice guidance by John of what we did. Does that have an effect on your brain? Possibly. We can explore that. That's an empirical question. We're looking at what the minimum amount of time required is to gain some sort of benefit. Uh, I'll just quickly say that that question always seems to come up. What's the minimum amount of time necessary to achieve benefit? Everyone wants to know that question. Uh, and I'll just have to give you this quick anecdote because that question came up in the presence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, a scientist asked His Holiness, what is the minimum benefit, do you think? Uh, to do these practices, and he, he smiled, and he said, lifetime. <laughs> and as if, as if it wasn't clear what the, the scientist was asking, she repeated and said, no, 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 I, I don't think you understood. I understand a lifetime is important, but what's the minimum amount of time necessary? And again, he says, lifetime. <laughs> so, uh, of course, not all of us have lifetimes to, uh, to practice, to gain some sort of benefit. We all want to achieve some benefit quickly, reduce our stresses. I think what we did today was some sort of demonstration of the benefit that you can have immediately. But we're interested in the whole spectrum. So what's happening even in the minds of the most advanced meditators uh, uh, as well? And we have to think of this as a form of mental training. Okay? So mindfulness is, also, is not only described as a state of awareness, but also as a systematic form of mental training okay, that can help reduce suffering and uh, reduce a lot of our stress, reduce inflammation, okay, and enhance flourishing. And that's why you see a brain there with well, weights. And this is a similar sort of metaphor to how you think of going to the gym. You go to the gym to exercise to build your muscles. Well, in this case, you're, building your, you're flexing your mental muscles by practicing meditation practice. Okay? Right, so and by doing this, by mapping the meditative mind, we have an ability to create a diagnostic tool. So we, for diagnostic purposes, we can determine uh, where people are. Are they at, at experiencing some level of stress by mapping uh, how meditators are handling stress? We can navigate the progress of a practitioner. How well are you doing in your uh, ability to handle stress? Uh, and how much progress have you made by sitting in, uh, uh, in meditation? And we can do this also to create targets for therapeutic purposes. Uh, neuroscience is now combining in psychiatry for, for ways of, uh, uh, of targeting very specific regions for neurofeedback. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, future applications for, um, um, for neurotherapeutics. So we can target more specifically at an individualized level, um, very systematic ways of, of um, delivering interventions. So whether they are pharmacotherapy augmented by meditation practices or meditation alone, 
we're going to be able to better understand the select populations that are going to benefit. Okay? We also, in a laboratory setting, we also need to realize that there are differences in somebody who's a beginning meditator and an, ex and a, and a, uh, an experienced meditator, someone who's been practicing for a long period of time. Someone who may practice every day and l for long periods of time have different levels of continuity and intensity in which they practice the meditation. So this is really important in the laboratory setting. And we sort of, we have to just note these differences. That someone who's in it to maybe have a goal of stress reduction, reduce a little stress, is very different from someone who has a goal for enlightenment, for example. Okay, and we have to, they're kind of like apples and oranges when we look on, in, under the microscope. So th that's something that we, we pay a lot of attention to. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm really going to try to give you a very specific outline of, of the habits of mind. Okay, what mental habits look like when people are suffering, when people are experiencing distress. What are the brain networks underlying those habits of mind, and how those brain networks may map onto very specific meditation practices that we study that are considered core mindfulness-based practices. So I will tell you a little bit about some of the models that we've created uh, and the brain network interactions that support the meditation process. So what you did for those few moments when you focused on your breath, I'm going to show you what was going on in your brain. Okay? And for those of you who are scared of neuroscience, don't be. I have color-coded everything for you. We'll end up with some take-home messages. And you will, you will leave here knowing what effects uh, meditation has on your brain. So given that this is titled Now and Zen, I thought I'd start with a quote by Dogen, who's a 13th century uh, 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 monk, uh, who actually started the Soto Zen tradition. Um, and he says, to study the way is to study the self. And to study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. To be enlightened by all things is to remove the barriers between oneself and others. There's so much wisdom in this quote, but I really wanted to just draw your attention to the fact that he's focusing on the self. The self is what transforms. And so that's where we start. And I want to focus on the self with you right now. We're going to talk about habits of mind because this is what's affected. This is where self, this something transforms by doing the practice. The self, we have a picture of, of me, in this sort of moment here. Uh, and uh, this is everything that you've ever experienced comes down to your moment of existence right now. Everything you're experiencing, feeling, tasting, your whole worldview comes down to this one moment. But the idea is that your experience of what's happening right now is based on a continuous string of moments that are strung together, that are condi conditionally reinforced through time. Okay and that are, are constantly uh, updating each other um, from, the, uh, from, the, from your birth, or before your birth, to the point of conception, all the way to the present moment day. And you can look at this, if we zoom in, on one moment of selfing, okay, you can see that one moment can be made up of not only perception, of sensory awareness, but also of evaluation. And this is, has a very specific time scale. Right? of, say, 500 milliseconds. Now, if I took an object, and I'm going to move out of the zone here so cameras can try to follow me. OK. So here's an object, right? Boom. Everyone get a sense of what this is. Something came to mind, right? A water bottle, right? That's a water bottle. And you might say oh, it's a small water bottle. It's an Aquafina water bottle. But just to give you a sense of what's happening when an object comes in front of you is that about for the first 250 milliseconds of processing what this is was totally unconscious. You were not aware of what your brain was doing to orient your attention to right here, or if I move it over here, or if I move it down here, or if I take it away, where is it? The point is that the first 250 milliseconds of processing any objects, any mental object, whether it's in an external world or it's some thought, image, or sound, is done very unconsciously. And that's happening at the perceptual level below sensory awareness. So only after 300 milliseconds do you finally start to evaluate the world. 
And sometimes that's where we get stuck. We get stuck just evaluating and processing over and over again, or fantasizing about the future, or reflecting on the past. But what I want to emphasize here is that there are very specific networks that, we, that can be mapped onto these different elements of processing the world. Okay? And essentially what we come down to is sort of a way that we can sort of justify or explain how we got to the present day by a string of moments of experiences. Now I've done the math here, and it's approximately about 40, 42,000 moments uh, for this guy to turn into that guy. Okay? That's what's happening. It's conditioning through life. All the things that happen in your life are creating your experience of the world. And I want to emphasize that because every moment becomes an opportunity to change your mind, to change your brain, to change how you see the world and experience the world. Every moment, every 500 milliseconds. Is that clear? What? Okay. So, so then we're left with this perspective on the world. Uh, with your needs, your wants, your fears, your expectations, your attitudes, everything. Your entire world view is created by this string of moments in your life. But what I want to emphasize here, whoops, is that your little perspective is very different, possibly, from the people around you. And there may be some overlap. You know, when you say, oh, I seem to resonate with that person or not. Or maybe you totally do not resonate with the person next to you, right? And if you don't, there might not be any overlap. But the point here is that your perspective on reality is completely distorted or biased. We all have distortions in how we see the world. Our worldview is always distorted at some level. Some of these distortions may lead to psychopathology. Some of them may not. But we're all biased, and we don't all see reality in the same way as it truly is. We all just have uh, a baggage, right? Our baggage of past experiences to help us orient and see the world in a particular way, right? Okay. So what happens when we have anger or anxiety and fear or sadness and, and see the world negatively? We have to keep in mind that those types of experiences are negatively reinforcing how you see the world, how you see yourself in the world. That's conditioning yourself to, to be an angry person or to be uh, anxious. A lot of the practices that we're talking about allow you to take some distance between your emotional experiences, your thoughts, to provide some sort of space in which you can experience these, uh, these really strong emotions okay, and sort of disidentify from them. Because if you don't, what happens is it reifies yourself. You become an angry person. I'm Dave the angry guy. Okay? I'm no longer Dave the happy guy. Right? And this, is a, this pervasive negative self-focus and worldview leads to the long-term impacts of stress on the mind and body. We know that just your perception of your stress can leave you with inflammation. The more that you perceive that stress is harmful, the more you have a what we call a threat-related profile in which you experience stress. Your, your blood vessels will constrict. You get high blood pressure. You may fall to the ground and faint at, at, in a serious way. Or you just may just be, have a, a full-on blown stress response, as John was, was suggesting. Right? Or you can have a challenge-related profile in which you, f which you confront your stresses in a way that's a, a, in a positive light, in an adaptive way. There's a very different profile where you see what looks like courage or joy. And your, your cardiac output is much more efficient, less likely to develop the long-term impacts of stress like cardiovascular disease, depression and anxiety. If, you have, if you're always feeling anxious and fear and sadness, again, this is conditioning yourself. All those processes of Perception, awareness, and evaluation. All those networks, brain networks that are active during each moment are being conditioned by those thoughts, what you fill your mind. So what do we do? How do we deal with this? Right? Well, Thich Nhat Hanh, who was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, Zen master also, 
um, who's been treated by at the MGH, um, who's recently in a coma, but he's doing better. He said, in order to transform the seeds of suffering into seeds of happiness, one must only look deeply and see clearly that both are manifestations of our own consciousness. We need only to water the seeds of happiness and avoid watering the seeds of suffering. It's really great. It's really great. So how does meditation help us water the seeds of happiness? Well, one of the most important facets of meditation practice. What does it do? It adds another level of selfing. What we refer to as meta-awareness. Awareness of awareness. Basically, so you are always monitoring, you're always aware of where your mind is. Is it mind wandering right now? What you're going to do after this? Is it wandering because you're confused? Is it thinking about you know, what you're going to have for dinner? Is it thinking that you left something somewhere? Is it thinking about a conversation you had with a colleague earlier. Where is your mind? The meditation helps strengthen this particular process more than anything else. The meta-awareness. Okay? Okay. So now I'm going to walk you through the systems of the brain that are supporting these types of processes. So don't get scared by little letters, little acronyms that are put into the brain. Okay, if you're familiar with those, great. If not, pay attention to the colors. Okay? I, I present the nice color coded for four networks of the brain that are affected by selfing. Okay? Here's the brain. So this is the blue network. It's, it's the otherwise known as a dorsal attention network. It also involves perceptual and premotor areas. This is where you were orienting yourself to the water bottle in that first 250 milliseconds, before you had conscious awareness. Your brain stem's working, okay? Your eyes are orienting in space. It's your action tendencies. It's the automatized sort of ways of moving your body and behavior without having to think about it. It also involves the skill-based uh, network of your brain that involves like, getting on a bike. You don't think about riding a bike. You just get on and ride it, right? Okay? So it's a very important network for skill-based learning. That's the blue network. Yellow network is also referred to as a central executive network. Okay, think of the, uh, you know, sort of the, the little guy in, inside your brain who's sort of monitoring the controls, making sure everything is going smoothly. This is your sort of working memory system. So it's keeping in mind maybe some instructions that you have to do a particular task, but it's really focused on present moment awareness. Okay, inside your body and out. Okay, this is the network that's usually active. The third network is uh, referred to as a default mode network, but you can think of it as the green network, okay, or the narrative self network. Okay, this is the network that's active. 50% of our lives almost is spent in this network. Uh, no matter what you're doing, you're typically mind wandering, and this is the network that comes online. It's creating our narrative, who we are, our autobiography in your own head, okay? And it's usually stuck in the past, thinking about what happened, or fantasizing, or worrying about the future, okay? We're never truly present. We're never truly here, unless you got that yellow network active, <laughs> right? Okay, so those are three networks. The last network is that, that meta uh, network, the network that's being strengthened a lot by meditation practice. This is a, an attentional network, a network that's really important for, for, for Cultivating attention. It's called the otherwise known as uh, uh, higher order attentional processing, uh, executive monitoring, the meta awareness. It also allows you to know where your mind is at any point and flexibly switch. If you want to be in the narrative, great. Just know that you're there. Don't get caught up in it. Sometimes we get stuck in that narrative, in that green network, right? We get stuck and we can't get out. Well, some of the, some of the the, uh, the uh, skills that you learn in meditation practice is to become aware of where your mind is. Oh, it's stuck on something negative. So you let it go. You just let it float down the stream. And that orange network helps, uh, helps you do that. Okay. So how do these networks map onto mindfulness-based practices? Here are the four practices that I, what we usually consider core to mindfulness. Focused attention, like you just did on the breath, 
Okay, this can be any object really, but we focus on the breath. Open monitoring, or, or otherwise known as a receptive form of meditation, this is referred to in Zen as Shikantaza, Choiceless Awareness by Krishnamurti. Uh, also insight or Vipassana meditation. This is where you're just open and aware of anything that arises and passes. And you're noting and labeling it, or you're just aware of it. Third practice is some sort of ethical enhancement practice like loving kindness. This is sending out sort of um, a uh, love, kindness, and compassion towards yourself, towards the people around you, to the strangers around you, the people who may be suffering, and to the most difficult people in your life. And lastly, John also mentioned this, yoga, tai chi, qing, on movement-based practices. So here are the four core mindfulness-based practices. And if you do all these, you're really doing the full, uh, what we would call a mindfulness-based intervention, especially if you do it for eight weeks. Okay, so these are the practices that we focus on. We've created models for how all these practices work. And that means they have very specific cognitive psychological constructs that underlie them with an underlying neurobiological framework that comes from the selfing that I described. So I'm going to just run you through one particular style of practice that you already did. So now you're going to know what you did and what happened in your brain while you did it. Okay. So we start with this framework of motor learning. That means the more you practice, the better you get, just like riding a bike. Okay, you're going to engage that, that skill-based blue network uh, the more you practice. And that's going to make your brain more efficient because it allows you to automatize a lot of the practice so then you can pay attention to the other tasks that you have in front of you. You then start with intention and motivation. They are internally driven means of how you're why you're practicing. Are you doing this just to you know, reduce a little stress, or are you trying to attain enlightenment? Okay, we can study these types of differences in people. Then you're given instructions. Follow your breath. Follow your breath. Keep that in your working memory. You focus your attention. You're alerting. You're orienting towards your breath. You're engaged with your breath. You're monitoring your breath. It stabilizes your mind. In, in Buddhist practice, this is what we call tranquility practice, or taming the mind through stabilizing it. Of course, uh, there's a lot of distraction usually, but what I want to emphasize here, this reiterative process of focusing on your breath, continually engaging on it, is, uh, uh, activates very specific networks. So you have your orange and yellow networks that are activated from this sort of executive function of forming set. When you're focusing attention on an object, it's the yellow network. The early attentional processing is the blue network. And the monitor is the orange network. Okay. So you're going to be distracted. Something comes up, unintended object, sensory or mental event. This is typically some sort of emotional type of valence associated with it, typically some sort of memory related. And this is very familiar to all of us, but we do it, like I said, about half our lives, is we ruminate a lot about ourselves. And typically, any form of rumination leads to unhappiness. This is just typical, but I will say that you can sit in the narrative with awareness and incubate creative ideas, plan for the future. So there's good things about being in the narrative, but most of the time, they just happen to be very self-critical. So how do we get out of that? So by meditating, the idea is that we continue to strengthen the monitor. And by strengthening that monitoring process, we learn to what we call decenter, or we, we recognize that our mind is wandering. And we remove ourselves from that stickiness. We inhibit that kind of response. We regulate our emotions. We gain some sort of equanimity. We come back to a nice baseline. We say, OK, we disengage from that thought. We go back to what we're supposed to be doing, which is focusing on the breath. Right? So again, we have very specific networks, the orange network and blue networks, that can be mapped onto this very specific process. Okay. So basically, what happens when we look at these networks and how these processes are functioning, we create six skills by which we think mindfulness is, is improving self-awareness, self-regulation, and self-transcendence, otherwise known as increasing pro-social behaviors. Right? It does this through the intention and motivation building and changing our intention and motivation. 
regulating our attention and stability and control and the clarity with which we experience the world, regulating our emotions by inhibiting these sort of impulses that we have to stick with some sort of negative thought process. Uh, we extinguish and reconsolidate adapt into uh, maladaptive forms of selfing into more adaptive forms of selfing. Okay? These are changing the way we actually process the world. This is where the, the rubber hits the road. This is where transformation happens. And we're increasing prosociality. This is an under-emphasized part of the practice. We actually are improving ourselves by being more connected to others. That's very important for this practice. They are altruistic forms of behavior, our emp empathy. These types of brain areas are also improving. And meta-awareness. Okay? So what does the basic neuroscience research show in terms of how it maps onto these, these types of models? There have been a number of studies done now that have looked at, there's uh, uh, about 26 neuroimaging studies that looked at the changes in the, in the brain in response to all different styles of meditation. There's been about 80 different neuroimaging studies, okay, from, from either fMRI, PET, or SPECT, different uh, modalities of imaging, but 80 studies. And all of these studies um, show some basic changes in the brain. And I'm just color coding them again for you by showing areas of the, the yellow network. So the experiential sort of self network is being uh, changing in size. The orange network is also changing in size. Areas like the dorsal anterior cingulate, the part, the part of your brain right behind your forehead, frontal polar cortex. That's the part of the brain that, that developed most recently in evolution that made us more human. Okay, it's a very interesting part of our brain um, in terms of the the actual space between our synaptic boutons inside, inside that part of your brain. There's more space there for more connections. More than 30 times more than your, the closest uh, non-human primate, like the bonobo. Okay, so that's changing in size. The insula is changing in size, which is a part of your brain responsible for, for awareness of where your body is and what's happening in your body. And your hippocampus, which is really important for learning, memory. Okay. And then in terms of function, where activity is happening in the brain during meditation, the same brain areas as that are changing in size, so that makes sense. But also uh, uh, parts of your caudate okay, are changing in size and function. The caudate is really responsible for, for skill-based learning. And then lastly, this PCC area, okay, right there. That's really important for the narrative network, and that's decreasing in activity. So I'm just going to thank uh, our lab that, um, here at Bring Women's Hospital in the Neuroimaging Laboratory, directed by David Silberswag and Emily Stern. Um, and we work with a lot of contemplatives specifically um, to uh, study meditators. And I just want to also thank you for your, your time and listening. And Sarah's going to really go into some more detail. Thank you. Do you want to introduce Sarah? Thank you, David. That was amazing. Um, I just want to say for anyone who is, uh, you know, maybe thinking about going to medical school, that the brain is not actually color coded. <laughs> I, I wish for some of my neuroanatomy grades that it had been. All right. Um, I am very pleased now to introduce Sarah Lazar, who is a, a friend and collaborator. Um, she is an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School and an associate researcher in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. So Sarah first discovered the benefits of yoga back in 1994 after an injury and found, to her delight, I suspect, um, that after only a few weeks of practice, she had pretty dramatic improvement. Um, since that time, she has made some outstanding breakthrough discoveries um, using neuroimaging to examine the impacts of yoga and meditation on brain activity and on brain structure. Um, her research really is looking at how to figure out what kind of neural mechanisms underlie the benefits of the practices that we've been talking about, um, both in clinical settings and in healthy people as well. 
Her work has been featured in the New York Times, USA Today, CNN, lots of other places. But the most important place to me, because as a kid I went to the Muse Museum of Science all the time, is she's actually had an exhibit there featuring her work. Please welcome Sarah Lazar. Good evening. Okay. Uh, this is not advancing. Here we go. All right. Um, I'm actually going to skip over some of this. Sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, John and David have given a wonderful introduction. So I'm going to skip some of my slides that I was planning on giving. Also get us back on track here. So um, as John talked about, there have been numerous studies now over the years showing that these meditation practices have many, many benefits. So it decreases stress. It's very effective for decreasing stress. And not only self-reported stress, but also various biomarkers associated with stress. So cortisol and uh, you know, telomere length and various other measures that are very tightly linked to stress. It also reduces symptoms associated with many, many diseases, including depression, anxiety, oops, uh, pain, and insomnia. Also, as Dave was saying, um, you know, we're getting a lot of the attention in, in executive networks, and there's actually been scientific studies showing that it can actually enhance your ability to pay attention. Uh, one of the studies, they gave people incredibly boring stuff to read, and they asked them, you know, whenever you notice your mind has wandered, hit a button, but also periodically a little uh, screen would pop up, you know, pop up with, uh, appear on the screen saying, were you paying attention or is your mind wandering? And what they found is that after eight weeks of training, the people, will, even with really incredibly boring text, were better able to stay focused on this text and that their mind didn't wander as much. Um, <clears throat> and then also, perhaps most importantly, there's increases in self-reported quality of life. So people just say, I'm happier, I'm more relaxed, um, I'm more satisfied with my life. And um, one thing that I always hear when I talk to people who've gone through these programs is, oh my god, it completely changed my life. And as uh, John mentioned, uh, I went through this myself. I went through, uh, um, I started doing yoga specifically for knee problems, and I did it purely as a form of physical therapy. And after a few weeks, I was saying, oh my god, it changed my life. And so, um, and so for me, I knew, like as David and, uh, was saying, you know, it changed how I saw the world, it changed how I experienced the world. And so I knew that something in my brain had changed. And so that's what I wanted to do. That's what I set out to do, is to understand what had happened in my brain that caused me to change how I viewed things. And so as a scientist, I said, OK, this suggests neuroplasticity. So all neuroplasticity means is something about the brain is changing. Something about how the neurons are talking to one another is changing. And um, this is just sort of, a, um, sort of an outline of how I was thinking, right? a summary of how I was thinking. So we know um, behavior. And you can just uh, um, our minds have behaviors, right? So someone who's depressed their mind tends to have depressive thought. Someone who's always anxious, their minds tend to produce a lot of anxiety. Right, that's a behavior. Those behaviors are dependent on brain activity. So we can show that people who, have, um, who are depressed or who are anxious, that their brain activity, even when they're just lying there not doing anything else, their brain activity is different than people who are not anxious or depressed. And brain activity is dependent on brain structure. And this, I just mean something about how the neurons talk to each other, how the neurons are wired to each other. And again, we know that people with anxiety and depression or pain, that their, their structure of the brain is different than people who are not um, depressed or anxious or in pain. And these differences in brain structure are what give rise to these differences in brain activity, and this is what gives rise to the changes in behavior. And you can see these arrows are bidirectional, which is important, because we know that the brain is plastic. We can change the brain. We can change how the brain is wired, and that then leads to decreases in depression, decreases in anxiety, decreases in pain, and all sorts of increases in positive things, like the satisfaction with life and the happiness. So that was the question I started with. You know, can we take a simple behavior, meditation, and show that it changes brain activity and brain structure, and that then these changes in brain structures then can lead to long-lasting changes in well-being? Um, so the first study we did was we were here in Boston, and luckily there's lots of people here in Boston who practice meditation, and we recruited uh, 20 people from the Boston area who regularly practice meditation, 
and we compare them to uh, 20 people who had done little or no meditation before in their life. And these yellow spots and red spots on the brain indicate where in the brain there was more gray matter um, in the brains of the meditators compared to the controls. And gray matter is the part of the brain, is the thinking part of the brain. So you've got gray matter and white matter. White matter is just wiring. Gray matter is the stuff on the outside of the brain, which is actually where all the thinking and the computation and the sensing and the feeling, all that actually happens. Um, and so we had several brain regions here that were bigger in the uh, brains of the meditators compared to the controls. So what are these regions? So I took some of Dave's uh, images from Dave's slides so we could, uh, color coding is useful. So the main region we found, um, you can see this good, is here, this area circled in green. This is the insula, right? And this is buried deep in Dave's uh, picture. It's, one, it's in this yellow network, which is the central executive sensory awareness system. Right? And specifically, the insula is involved in um, awareness of visceral processes, such as heart rate and breathing rate. So it makes a lot of sense if you're sitting there spending 40 minutes a day watching your breath, observing your breth, that the area of the brain that's observe actually observing the breath should get bigger. It's also involved in integrating thoughts and senses with your emotions and uh, recognizing facial, discussion, uh, recognizing facial uh, emotions. And it's physically smaller in people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The other region we found was here in the front of the brain, right behind the eye, right? And again, this was uh, the, uh, the yellow and orange networks in Dave's pictures, right? Which is the central executive and frontal parietal control networks, right? This is the meta-awareness regions. And this region in particular is involved in working memory and selective attention. And this region in particular, um, when they give people IQ tests, this is the main region that's associated with IQ, right, which is also referred to as food intelligence. And so um, what this means is being able to take facts and figures and do something useful and novel with them, right? And what was interesting is then uh, we did this first study, and then um, when we found that, we did a follow-up study where we again got long-term meditators and controls and also some long-term yoga practitioners, and we actually gave them the standard IQ test, right, or the fluid intelligence test. And, uh, oops, so sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Sorry. Okay, hold that thought. All right, what was cool when we looked at this data was this. So the blue are the meditators and the red are the controls. So it's well known that our entire brain shrinks as we get older, right? And this is part of the reason that as we get older, um, we're not quite as sharp sometimes as we were when we were younger. We have a little bit harder remembering things and keeping track of things. And so um, it's well established that as we see in the controls that our brain starts to shrink. What we see is that in this one region, that the 50-year-old meditators had the same amount of gray matter as the 25-year-olds, suggesting that meditation may actually slow down um, or prevent normal, cognitive, normal decline in the brain, right? So that uh, it may actually slow things down and prevent normal cognitive decline. So like I said, so we repeated the study with long-term meditators, long-term yoga practitioners, and we gave them the fluid intelligence test, right? And what we found is that the performance on this test was similar to what we're seeing with the brain structure. So the solid line here, this is the controls with little or no previous yoga or meditation experience. And then this top line is the yoga practitioners and the second line is the meditation practitioners. And the yoga practitioners had on average twice as much practice as the meditation practitioners. So I think that's why they're, they're being a little bit better preserved than the, control, the meditators. But what we can see is that both the yoga and the meditation practice seems to preserve fluid intelligence, so your cognitive ability to stay sharp, um, compared to the controls. So it's not just that your brain is staying, um, uh, is preserving the brain structure, it's actually also preserving the function of the brain and helping us stay sharp as we get older. Um, another group out at UCLA did a similar study, and they looked at white matter, which again is the wiring of the brain. And again, it's well known that as we get older, that wiring starts to break down. And this is a little hard to see, but she looked at all over the brain, not just in the front of the brain, but all over the brain. And what she found was the same thing, that compared to the controls, who uh, their rate of decline was pretty fast, the meditators had much slower rates of decline in every region that she tested. So it really does suggest that it's having an impact on all of our brains and helping our entire brains remain more youthful. Um, but there's, of course, there's other interpretations, right? Because in all these studies, we just looked at one time point. We took long-term meditators and compared them to controls. 
And so a lot of people said, well, you know, people who meditate, they're different. They're weird, <laughs> right? And so people said that to me, to my face, right? So, and, so <laughs> and they said, well, you know, maybe they're just like that before they started, right? There's something about people whose brains are not going to decline or that who have lots of gray matter in these regions that they're just more likely to meditate. They're more likely to continue meditating, right? Or maybe it's because, you know, they take 40 minutes out of their day. I always laugh at that one. You know, here in America, we spend so much time watching TV. You know, we take lots of time out of our day to relax. It's not just taking time out of our day to relax, right? And of course, meditators often, um, a lot of them are vegetarian or, um, you know, so perhaps it was their diet or there's something about their lifestyle. You know, they wouldn't believe that it had anything to do whatsoever with the meditation. And so um, to address this, and those are all legitimate complaints. So what did we do? Um, so as um, you know, John and Dave told you, you know, people going through these eight-week programs, you know, even just eight weeks of these stress reduction programs, they come out saying, oh my God, it changed my life, right? And so, um, and there was some data having nothing to do with meditation that suggests that you can actually see changes in the brain over a relatively short period of time. So we said, okay, can we actually show that brains are changing in eight weeks? And the short answer is yes. Okay, so this is um, a handful of the regions we found. Um, and again, we got Dave's uh, handy color coding to help us out here. So the primary region we found changing was here, it's called the PCC. This is like considered like deceit of selfing, right? This is here, this is this big green area here in the back of the brain, the posterior cingulate. Um, and it's involved in, uh, the primary region involved in mind wandering. It's the main region that is impacted in Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, this is the main region that gets deteriorated. Um, and of course, Alzheimer's, the hallmark of Alzheimer's is mind wandering. And it's also involved in self-referential processing and um, in, in, um, in mem so, uh, memories about the self. The second region we found, where's my cursor? Can you see it? Oh, there it is, okay. It's here, this is the TPJ, which is here on Dave's map, which is in this orange network. So this is an area that's involved in, involved in seeing things from other people's point of view, which is a key component of empathy and compassion, because the best way I can feel empathy for you is if I understand how you're feeling. Um, and then here, this region, this is the hippocampus. This is one of the primary regions important for um, learning and memory. And this is here in uh, the screen area in Dave's map. Um, so these are three of the regions. Um, I just said all this, okay. Um, another reason we found was that the uh, amygdala got smaller. So the amygdala is the main fight or flight part of the brain. It's the main area of stress. In fact, in um, animals, if you stick an electrode in and you stimulate the amygdala, you, the, you, they do this in cats, and the cat will be sitting there and purring and completely happy. They stick the electrode in, they zap the electrode, and the cat starts to hiss. And you know, um, it's it's so it's 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 um, the number one region that's been associated with anxiety and fear and and stress. And it got smaller pre-post eight weeks. And importantly, the change in the amygdala correlated with changes in self-reported stress. So people aren't just going through these eight-week programs and saying, "Oh yeah, I feel less stressed." That there is actual neurological reasons why they're feeling less stressed because their amygdala is actually getting smaller. The final region we found was down the brainstem, and this was not on Dave's map, um, but this is the area of the brain where a lot of the mood molecules are actually produced. So the dopamine, the serotonin, and the norepinephrine are all produced in this area where we're finding changes. And what we found was that the change in this region correlated with changes in well-being. So how satisfied you felt with your life. Um, so the changes in that correlate with changes here in this region. So altogether, this really suggests that, yes, meditation really can uh, change your brain in as little as eight weeks. Um, and so um, um, I'm just going to leave it there. And so um, I'm just going to leave it there. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was amazing, too. Um, so we're bumping up against 7.30. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stay. We're going to take questions and answers. But anyone who has to go, feel free to go. If you're sick of hearing me talk, feel free to go. I won't be insulted. But I will ask them to take names as you leave. It's a joke. All right, I'm going to invite uh, David and Sarah up to the chairs here. We'll give folks a. a some time to file out.
while the real diehards stay for the real learning now. Thanks. More questions for me? <laughs> Excellent. Because I am loud, I'm going to start talking while you all file out and just ask you to be as quiet as possible as you leave so everyone who's remaining can, can hear what I say. So I'm going to start with one question um, that was about the, the DNA study that I talked about. And, and the question basically is, was, this, was I talking about good or bad stuff happening to the DNA? Um, that's a very good question. So. Uh, just to remind everyone, I was talking about not the DNA itself changing, but good, good and bad genes being turned on and off. Primarily, we were looking at, at good genes being turned on and bad genes being turned off. But talking about good and bad genes is, is always kind of uh, simplified in that there's no such thing really as a good gene and a bad gene. There are times when it's good to have certain genes on and times when it's good to have certain genes off. What we were looking at was changes that appeared to suggest positive changes for health, to, to put it very, very simply. But like I said before, all of this work that we're doing with gene expression is at very early stages. And there's some very, very promising things. You know, if you, if you uh, talk to a journalist, for example, not, to, not that there's anything wrong with journalists, but it's very easy to want to take the sort of the headline you know, it's like, meditation is great. It does great things for your genes all the time. But of course, things are not that simple. Um, and what we're trying to do is figure out in a very, very detailed way, what are the kinds of things that these sorts of practices are good for? What are they not good for? And in what ways are they like stuff like exercise? In what way is meditation like exercise in the sense that Probably pretty much everyone should exercise. You might want to talk to your doctor first to make sure that it's OK for you to do it. In the same way, probably pretty much everyone would benefit from meditation, yoga, tai chi, those kinds of practices. I don't know if you guys have any other comments on that. No, OK. Um, all right, and this other one I like. Um, can we practice that breath meditation in public? <laughs> And I would say, absolutely. Just make sure, you know, there are no shady characters around you if you're closing your eyes. No, seriously. But this is, this is the kind of thing, just like, you know, the crowds of people in China practice Tai Chi on public. There's nothing wrong with doing this sort of uh, thing uh, in groups, maybe even in large groups, out in the open, et cetera. Okay, standing yeah. in line at the store, waiting yeah, for the very, bus. Yeah, that's a very, very good point, yes. On the sterile drive. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> waiting for a red light. Okay, so uh, this is a good question for one of you guys to take. What is the difference between mindfulness and meditation? Ah. I'll, I'll say one thing. So meditation is an English word. It's translated from the Sanskrit bhavana. Okay, bhavana means cultivation, or the, the Tibetan word is gom, gom. And so from these, uh, these words, the Sanskrit and the Tibetan, it, um, meditation reflects a cultivation of familiarity with one's own mind. That's what meditation is. Okay? Does that be clear? So, I would say there's many different types of meditation. So often, when people think of meditation, you think of chanting and mantra. And uh, so mindfulness is just one very specific type of meditation. Um, and so, and it doesn't involve chanting or mantra. It just involves breath awareness. Um, and so, and it's also, it's a skill, it's a state, it's a, you know, there's a lot, mindfulness is, is it's sort of a, it's a catch-all word, but it's, um, so there are types of meditation that are not mindful, um, and mindfulness is just a very specific type of meditation. I'll say that in some ways, mindfulness has become so popular as a word that some people use it to, when they're referring to not just meditation or mindfulness meditation, but to sort of every kind of mind-body thing in general. Um, kind of so like what Zen 
Yeah, you know, exactly. Zen was exactly. Oh. Um, I, I sort of I sort of view it as have you ever known someone who like had a name that like the other kids in school couldn't really pronounce right, and they started answering to any version of that name that people said. In the same way, I think a lot of us in the field will will, will answer to sort of any word that's commonly used for uh, the kinds of stuff that we that we work on. So there are a couple of questions that I thought were really good about age and and meditation. And uh, you know, one very simple one, very uh, clear one: Can you learn to meditate at any age? And then uh, following up on that, what kinds of uh, you know, is there a time at which brain changes stop happening? Right. Um, as you get older. So the first question is, um, there are a couple of very well-known meditation teachers who started practicing in their 40s and 50s and 60s. So definitely you can, and they became you know very good teachers and very adept at it. So definitely you can start at any age. Um, and then um, in terms of is the brain plastic, we don't know. I actually just got funding. Uh, we're actually starting a study. We're looking for subjects right now, actually, if you're over 65. Um, and so that's the question. Is, and so we're going to take, because my first study was with people between the ages of 25 and 50. So now we're looking at people between the ages of 65 and 80. And um, we're going to ask that same question. You know, does the brain change in the same way in these older people as it does in the younger people? So um, I can answer that in about three years. <laughs> Yeah, so it probably is going to be the same, though. My, that's my sense. Again, given what they report, my sense is that it's probably going to be very similar. G given what we know, uh, there was some follow-up questions here as well. Given what we know about brain development, is there an age at which we think that there's an optimal time to start these sorts of practices if they do change the brain? Mm. Birth? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> Birth? No. Yeah, no. Yeah. 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 I've never tried to teach a baby to meditate, but I think it's like exercise. It's never too late to start. It's never too. Mm -hmm. There's never a good never time or bad time. Never too early to start. Yeah. I certainly know yeah. people who have, uh, you know, done simple exercises with even very very young children, and uh, we've done work with you know school age children from sort of the earliest up through high school, and shown clear benefits in in how kids are able to handle stress and be more resilient. I should say one thing because this is um this is an important topic in education now. Um, how a lot of these mindfulness-based um, interventions are in, are being introduced into K through 12 curriculum, and there there has been you know some success in terms of doing this in an integrated way. So transforming the entire classroom, um, at all at all grades, um, but there's no standard model yet for what's the best curriculum to use. Um, there's a lot out there. Um, and so it's unclear exactly, um, you know, what's the not only is what's the best curriculum, but what age groups are going to be best um, benefited from doing them, because we know that it's not. I, I'm 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 going to be bold enough to say that this is not good for everybody, <laughs> okay? Because we know that some people are not going to benefit from doing these practices, but the majority of people may. And so I think we're still trying to figure out who who. It benefits most and even what age groups um, as well and so we actually have a study we just looked at a 20-year follow-up of kids who were in third fourth and fifth grade who were exposed to a whole integrated classroom that, that incorporated mindfulness and there seems to be differences between them and their peers um, that seem to benefit them so the evidence seems to be suggesting that it's good even at, at as young as third grade so there are a number of questions about, essentially about controls for the, some of the experiments that I and others talked about. Um, things like, uh, you know, did we control for obesity? Did we control for diet? And obviously in some studies there have been attempts to do that sort of thing. And the studies that I talked about, at least the genomic study that I talked about, the numbers were so small that we couldn't, you, you can't make any kind of inferences statistically when, when we looked at that. So that, that I really don't have an answer to for the genomic stuff. In the, in the study that was on utilization, was on healthcare broadly, we, we definitely, there were so many people in that study that uh, we could control for a lot, but we were looking at, this was a, what's called a retrospective study, where we were looking back in a database. So the kinds of information we had didn't include that kind of stuff. Um, uh, what it did, what was the other question I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask here? Oh, the other, the other thing is, a very astute question was asked is, in that study where we were looking at healthcare utilization, could we distinguish between people who didn't need healthcare anymore and people who decided they just weren't going to get help anymore? 
Um, and the answer is no, we don't know. And that's why we're starting to do studies that look, instead of looking back at a database, we're looking forward. So we take people at the beginning and we track them going forward in a way that will allow us to make those kinds of inferences um, better from our, from our data. Um, all right, there were a couple of folks here either who had had strokes themselves or who had family members um, who had had strokes who were wondering if meditation could have positive effect, effects even on a brain that had uh, experienced a stroke. So I'm not aware of research with strokes, but there has been research with uh, early dementia, and even with people with early dementia are able to benefit. And so my guess is that um, if they can pay attention, they will benefit. Yeah, the other thing is um, there has been some work with traumatic brain injury, um, specifically where you see inflammation as a big problem in what um, exacerbates the, uh, the, the, the negative outcomes of traumatic brain injury. You see meditation helps reduce that inflammation and thus um, uh, improve outcomes. So uh, in, that, in, that, in, in that regard, you would think that stroke would be a, a one, at least, domain where meditation could help. But I don't know of any studies either on stroke specifically. Do we have time to take one more question? Is that all right? I see the red light flashing. Um, OK, so um, if I can find it here. We're so enthusiastic about this stuff, we can't stop talking. That's the... Um, I can't, I can't find night. the card here, but, but the, the question, I think this is a great one to end on, is, okay, we talked a lot about individual benefit, right? Benefit to your health, benefit to your brain. Is there a possibility, do we have evidence for this stuff benefiting society? Yes, one so one of my favorite studies was with a group of therapists. They split the therapists in half and they taught half of the therapists how to meditate. Um, and this was in an inpatient psychiatric unit in Europe. And the therapists, um, none of the patients learned how to meditate, right? So only the therapists were meditating. And it was a double-blind study because neither the therapist nor the patients knew that a study was happening. It was just the training director was doing a little study behind everyone's back. Mm -hmm. And what he found is that the patients who were, the patients of the meditating therapist had better outcome than the patients of the non-meditating therapist. And so it suggests that, and I've talked with a lot of therapists who meditate, and what they say is that yes, when you meditate, that you know, you are less reactive, you're better able to pay attention, you have more compassion, more empathy. And so they felt like they were just better able to, they're more in tune with their patients, they're better able to understand their patients, they're better, uh, they're more, less reactive to their patients. And so their patients benefited from their being more present and less reactive. And certainly, again, uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence about this uh, from many of my friends, you know, they get lots of feedback from their family that, oh yeah, I can tell, you meditated today, Mom. Like some of my friends, <laughs> you know, uh, because you know, you know, you, you, know, you didn't meditate today, Mom, because you know you really lost it. And so, so there's <laughs> definitely you hear this a lot from the families of people who meditate that they really notice that those people have changed, and it does ha seem to have an impact on the people around them. Um, so I do think that that um, yes, it impacts you, it impacts the people around you, and hopefully, gradually with time, it can impact whole societies. Yeah, let's let's not forget what Dogen was saying that you know, in order for self to transform. The, 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 the boundary between self and other dissolves, okay? That distinction between self and other dissolves, it goes away, okay? That's what's transforming. And honestly, the evidence that we have at this point for um, doing these practices, which in, involve a very explicit practice of loving kindness towards yourself and others around you. So that's improving pro-social types of behavior. Not only your ability to connect with others through empathy, so understanding what other people are thinking for, for, um, uh, for that matter, but also for sort of breaking down the barriers, for being more altruistic in how you connect with others. So that, I think that's really uh, an important aspect of how we can start to see better connection, you know, better sort of real genuine human connection between self and other. Thank you guys so much. We have to wrap up now. Um, Thank you.
I know I can stay a little while longer and folks can come down and uh, we can take questions individually or in a group. Also, the video will be online in the next week or two if you want to watch it over and over again. That's perfectly acceptable. Thank you all very much. Fantastic. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Great, thank you. Uh,